Yes. For due process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. can be a lethal weapon, especially if the driver is drunk. But what if the driver is drowsy, falls asleep behind the wheel, and kills someone in the process? Should there be penalties? How severe should they be? I'm Raymond Brown, and on our docket for this edition of Due Process, a movement to redefine vehicular homicide by making driving while sleepless a major crime. Would that be better justice? Would it be enforceable? We'll hear some strong feelings from both sides, but first, here's Sandy King with the story behind the proposed legislation. Raymond, the story begins on a Camden County road with a tragic crash that killed a young woman. It continued in a courtroom with a trial that ended in acquittal, and it turned an outraged mother into an activist. The outcome, a bill to put driving while tired on the forbidden list. It's known as Maggie's Law in memory of the daughter who died in that crash almost six years ago. Say something. She's on her way to work. She was in college, but was uh, doing the summer. 11.30 in the morning. But Maggie McDonald never made it to work. Instead, a man who'd been partying all night, who'd been up for about 30 hours, was driving a van in her direction. Witnesses saw him weaving, you know, waking up, coming back, and finally after the third time, of course, three ladies had hit her head on. He knew he was in trouble. He knew every time he woke up and caught himself, he should have pulled over. He chose not to stop. He chose not to sleep. It was all his choices. She died. He went to trial twice. Forty postponements and delays took a three-and-a-half-year time period. And in the end, he was acquitted of vehicular homicide. Not guilty doesn't mean innocent. In this case, it means there's a big loophole in the law. In fact, his lawyer had successfully argued that in New Jersey, it was simply not illegal to stay awake all night, drive, and fall asleep at the wheel. I couldn't accept it, and I just figured I, I, you have two choices, lay down and die or try to get up and break the rule that was done because in the court system. It was such an injustice. It was an outlandish injustice done. So Carol McDonald launched a campaign, a one-woman crusade that could actually make new law, not just here in New Jersey, but across the country. With poor nocturnal sleep, uh, let's say you're getting only five, six hours a night, you're going to have a much poorer reaction time to react to uh, the dangers in the road. And this can result in motor vehicle accidents. And with no sleep, the risk gets even greater. For instance, sleep researchers say just staying awake for 24 hours can produce impairment equal to or greater than what the law considers legally drunk. They have to realize that it can be very dangerous if they fall, uh, fall asleep or start dozing. They're going to hurt, hurt, hit somebody, hurt themselves, maybe kill somebody on the road. It's very serious. So the new laws being considered focus not just on those who party all night, but those whose work can keep them up for days at a time, and those who may be sleep-deprived and driving for a living. Sometimes you can tell by the way they're driving if, they, if they're sleepy, if they're swerving a little, if they're slowing down and speeding up. I don't go down the road drowsy. If I get tired, I go to bed. I just, I just, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to kill myself or anybody. And these trucker logs are supposed to help. 
supposed to be filled up every day. DOT requires you to be within two hours uh, if you get stopped and checked out. California, they'll just stop you, do a, a law check, uh, and they'll shut you down eight hours to 24 hours. But some jobs can cause sleep deprivation before the worker gets on the road. It may even be those whose work is to save lives. We researched and, and had questionnaires for residents and their sleeplessness being over 24 to 36 hour shifts and then having to drive home. Case in point, the notoriously overworked doctors in training. Uh, but it's, it's a problem, the long shifts. And I mean, they try and get sleep while they're here as residents, but often at certain rotations, they're awake 90% of the time and only get maybe an hour of sleep, which is really not enough. And that's a, that's a major problem. It's sleeplessness. And at sleep clinics like this one, the effects of sleeplessness get measured, whatever its cause. The holiday weekend, it was it was a nightmare because everybody's trying to get home. And, and you know if they've driven like 14, 15 hours and they're tired. And, and I saw more wrecks this weekend than I've ever seen the whole time I've been driving. And sometimes there's no doubt that a driver has ignored the lack of sleep. The man who's dozing off caused the crash that killed Maggie McDonald admitted that he'd been up for most of two days. But without a law that says that's illegal, he was able to walk away in what Maggie's mother insists was a shocking miscarriage of justice. Maggie's blog would close what she calls a tragic loophole in the law. Everybody has to be accountable for their own actions, and uh, hopefully this bill will make people wake up and realize that if they do kill someone, it's against the law. The entire doesn't give you a right to kill someone. But should there be a legal distinction between choosing not to sleep and just being unable to sleep? Should getting behind the wheel be illegal in either case? And how could it be enforced? If you toss and turn all night but just can't sleep, should it be your moral and legal responsibility to not drive to work the next day? Those are just some of the questions raised by proposed bills at the state and national level. The federal bill has been introduced by South Jersey Congressman Rob Andrews. His bill, like the one that's already passed the state Senate here, is simply known as Maggie's Law. And the sponsor of Maggie's Law in the State Assembly will be here in the studio along with a lawyer who won acquittal for the other driver in Maggie McDonald's fatal crash. That's when we come back, so stay with us. somebody you could kill a lot of people you should stop pull over and rest or don't even leave from where you're coming from i think you're guilty i don't think they should be prosecuted unless unless it's been shown they did it with some kind of extreme disregard for the condition that sometimes you can get in a car and just not realize you're tired you're actually driving you'd be surprised how many people are drowsy and don't have enough sleep and are sleep deprived and uh they are aware of it and if they're negligent in that regard they should be prosecuted it's a serious thing when you drive a car. You're taking the opportunity to kill people, hurt people, maim people, etc. I don't think people make a conscious effort to go and do damage to someone if they get behind a wheel and they're tired. Um, I don't know. It, w it would have to depend on the circumstances and why they were sleepy and fell asleep behind the wheel. And how would a jury draw those distinctions? Assemblyman George Geist, Maggie's law sponsor, says it can and should be done. Wayne Powell, who represented a sleepless driver in the crash that caused Maggie's death, says to criminalize falling asleep at the wheel would be like criminalizing drinking. And with us from Newark, Pam Mayolo of AAA, New Jersey, who says sleepless driving is a safety problem, but it's very hard to prove. Welcome to all of you. Assemblyman, let me start with you. Uh, for a long time in New Jersey, uh, reckless driving that causes a death has been a crime. You're not just an assemblyman, but also a former prosecutor, so you know the criminal justice system. Why was it necessary, or what led you to draft the change in the law? Well, first of all, Maggie's mom, Carol, came into my office, inspired me to correct the injustice of our justice system. These cases involving fatalities 
should not be prosecuted in the municipal court with a part-time prosecutor and a part-time judge. Justice requires a professional prosecutor, a professional judge, and a jury decision. My legislation will enable that. But reckless conduct, when it leads to death, has always been a crime in New Jersey. Without regard to the cause of the recklessness, why did you think it was necessary to draft the bill, and what did you say in the bill that changes the current law? Thank you. First of all, this is about cases involving fatalities, and it's limited to prosecutions where the prosecutor can prove the defendant went without sleep for over 24 hours. That is the standard of mothers against drunk drivers. That is the standard supported by AAA and traffic safety experts. But Wayne, let me bring you into the conversation. You represented the man who was charged in connection with the death of Maggie. Yep. Um, first of all, Maggie's mom said in the report we showed the viewers that there wasn't much question but that he had been falling asleep on and off. Was that established by the state at trial? Well, there was testimony from a truck driver who was traveling along behind Mr. Coleman that, in fact, he observed some conduct that was consistent with someone who might have been having some difficulty with remaining awake prior to the time that the collision occurred. Now, is it your position that under no circumstances should sleep, which causes reckless driving, lead to criminal prosecution and conviction? Well, that, that's not my position. My position is, however, that it's a very difficult prospect to legislate. For instance, this legislation is often compared to drunk driving legislation. Well, when we talk about drunk driving, we talk about an individual who introduces a foreign substance into his body, and we know from empirical studies that it can result in certain kinds of impairments. Well, sleep's a little different. Sleep is a biological function. It's not something that's a foreign substance which is introduced to the body. It's something that we undergo on a regular um, period um, throughout um, each day of our lives, literally. But don't we have some control over our sleep patterns, or aren't we required to do that? Well, that depends on your definition of control. You know, think about last night when you fell asleep, the moment that you went to sleep. You can't recall it, and you can't recall it because it's not a volitional well, act. I'm pretty sure I did go to sleep. Absolutely. Uh, let me bring Pam into the conversation. Pam, I know you're concerned about sleepless driving, but also concerned about the issue of how you prove it. Uh, let me suggest something. Is it probably true, despite the statistics, that at one point or another, probably everyone almost has nodded for at least a second somewhere while driving if you have a long period of driving in your life? Well, I think if you have a long period of driving, perhaps you felt drowsy over time. Um, and from our perspective, once you feel drowsy, it is your obligation to leave the roadway and pull off to a safe spot and uh, take that nap that you need or get out of the vehicle, walk around a little bit, uh, have some caffeine, get yourself back into the, uh, the awake mode, so to speak, and make sure that you're alert. No one should be driving regardless of the reason, whether it's alcohol or um, sleep deprivation, if they are not alert and able to react as they should behind the wheel. Does AAA support the Assemblyman's legislation or the federal equivalent? Well, uh, AAA is in the education business, and we feel that anything that can be done uh, in order to educate the public to the need to be driving alert uh, is where we would like to put our focus. So that means that you would prefer to spend resources on educating people and not on prosecuting criminal cases? We have spent our resources since uh, 1993 in earnest uh, bringing forward the topic of drowsy driving and making people aware of the fact. And we feel that at this point in time, drowsy driving is recognized by the public only as second to alcoholism, uh, or alcohol driving rather, uh, as the leading crash cause for fatal accidents. Wayne, let me ask you this. What do you think was the key factor in causing the jury to acquit the defendant in your case? Um, New Jersey's statutory definition of recklessness. Recklessness under New Jersey's law requires that there be a um, conscious disregard of a substantial um, and unjustifiable risk that um, a particular result will occur. Well, the state was unable to establish to the jury's satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Coleman consciously disregarded that substantial and unjustifiable risk. Well, are you saying that under no circumstances could a person be aware that they hadn't slept for a long period of time, get behind a wheel, and therefore be consciously disregarding a risk that an accident might happen? Absolutely, I think that that could happen. But in Mr. Coleman's case particularly, there, there was no evidence that he went through that mental process. As a matter of fact, for a very short period of time, 
before the accident occurred, he rested, although he admitted that he didn't actually fall asleep. And his response to police officers on the scene when they had an opportunity to speak to him was, I felt okay. I felt rested. I felt like I could get home to, to Cheslehurst from Camden without any difficulty. And I think that that was perhaps the most telling aspect with respect to whether or not the state could prove this issue of recklessness, because again, it deprived the state of any sub significant proof that he had made a knowing choice to drive when he felt unable to do so because of sleeping. Gentlemen, is that what caused you to agree with Maggie's mother that it was time to make a change in the law? The state should be able to present a case to a grand jury and let a grand jury decide whether someone should be indicted for vehicular homicide when a driver has gone for over 24 hours without sleep. But let me put a case to you that maybe isn't reached by your legislation, and I would like to know if you're concerned about it. Sure. A person who doesn't sleep for 30 hours gets a nap for a couple of hours, gets up, and begins to drive, may think they're all right, but may very well be drowsy enough to begin to lose sleep. That's not really covered by the law you've drafted. That is accurate. We are literally emphasizing as AAA and Mothers Against Drunk Drivers to wake up New Jersey to the phenomena of fatigue causing fatalities. And if this legislation helps wake up New Jersey, that if you drive without sleep for 24 hours, you are so impaired as to be reckless. But then it sounds as though you're using the criminal law primarily as an educational tool because there obviously are some cases that I think you and Maggie's mom and members of the assembly would care about that are not covered by this. So it sounds like you're as interested in waking people up as you are in using this as an actual tool for prosecution. There's no question that it would be a very difficult, challenging case to prosecute. But the reality is, as a public servant, I have a responsibility to promote public safety and we're doing that through this program right now. Now, when you're an experienced criminal defense lawyer, how difficult is it going to be for prosecutors in a typical case to prove that a person was drowsy or asleep? I mean, it's not likely that many people, once they know about this law, will say I was drowsy. Passengers are likely to either not want to incriminate someone or maybe feel they'd be responsible if they let a friend fall asleep. So how easy is it going to be for prosecutors to prove these things? Well, I think you put your finger squarely on the problem with this legislation as a whole. It requires that one be knowingly fatigued, and it seems to me that the only way that the state will be able to establish that is by confession of the defendant. If we don't have a defendant who admits that I felt fatigued at the time I got behind the wheel, it seems to me you can never really prove one of these offenses. The problem that I have with the legislation as it's drafted is that it seems to me it doesn't get at the problem that Maggie's mom seemed to be concerned about. She felt that there was an injustice because Mr. Coleman escaped prosecution um, in a case where he gave an indication that he had not slept for approximately 30 hours. I think that's where the 24-hour bright line test comes in, but I believe that there are substantial problems um, with that as well. I think any kind of a bright line test when you're talking about criminal prosecutions is a net for the unwary. Um, and what it does is essentially it casts a very broad net, which is likely to snare people that this legislation is not intended to affect. Um, and remember, this is a second-degree offense, and it subjects those persons who are convicted of the offense to as much as 10 years in state prison. And let me ask you this. It seems to me that given the campaign against drunk driving of the last quarter century, there is a tremendous stigma attached to drunk driving. And there's virtually nobody in the community that isn't aware of this issue and of the stigma. Uh, it doesn't strike me that driving while drowsy is even close in terms of a public awareness. And many, many people who are otherwise extraordinarily law-abiding won't focus on themselves as the person you're really talking to. Well, I think that's uh, absolutely correct, that uh, 25 years ago or so, um, you went to a party, you had a couple of drinks, you got behind the wheel, and off you went home. Um, and hopefully you got there safely and didn't harm anyone else around you while doing so. Um, there was a tremendous outpouring, tremendous campaigns, grassroots efforts, um, AAA, MAD, a number of different groups, legislation, to bring drunk driving to uh, a halt. Um, and we hope through education, uh, through awareness, through the assemblyman's uh, uh, proposition here, that uh, that awareness will also come to the forefront. And hopefully not 25 years from now, but in a shorter period of time, uh, we will know that drowsy driving is as harmful uh, to uh, others around you and to yourself as driving drunk has been uh, looked down upon now. So we've got to get out the word, get the campaign going, continue with educating uh, not only uh, truck drivers, but party goers, uh, young people, that you cannot be sleepy and get behind the wheel. You need to be alert.
Would it be your prediction that this legislation or legislation like this also in sister states is going to change the way people think about driving while sleeping? Well, I think, again, it's an education process and um, hopefully through, again, grassroots efforts and things like Maggie's Law, AAA's moves, um, and emphasis in many other areas, excuse me, we will bring that to the forefront. Senator, let me ask you about the institutions that, in a sense, encourage sleepless, sleeplessness. Uh, hospitals, for example, that work doctors' long shifts, and other places of business where effectively there's no way for people to get to and fro work without some kind of transportation, and where inevitably those institutions are encouraging people to take the kind of risk that you are opposed to. Um, they're not affected by this legislation. I mean, they're not going to be facing criminal charges in all likelihood. How do you uh, overcome that kind of institutional hurdle to what you want to accomplish? We will strive to enable society to reflect upon the reality that throughout society there are moms named Carol with daughters named Maggie. One thing I've learned, many of my colleagues have constituents who have lost family members in accidents involving fatalities caused by fatigue. These cases are prosecuted in municipal court. The more people know about the injustice of the justice system, the sooner the better in terms of accomplishing a real reform. There's no question we're climbing the mountain. We will be the first in the nation to establish a new element of recklessness 24 hours without sleep. Now, Lane Powell will do something to you that's been done to me all my life. If people assume that there's a gap between what criminal defense lawyers do when they represent clients and what they really feel. Um, if someone that you cared about and loved were struck by an automobile and killed, and a prosecutor came and said, we're going to apply Maggie's law, but we always talk to the victim's family. Um, would your being sympathetic to the victim, would your being close to the situation cause you to see this as good legislation? Oh, I, I think anyone who has been through the experience that Maggie's mom has been through would see it as something positive. But that, again, I think is the pitfall of this kind of legislation. It's very warm, very fuzzy legislation. It makes us feel emotionally better. But in the end, it, it's legislatively wrongheaded. And I think it's legislatively wrongheaded because if our desire is to educate the public about the possible um, pitfalls of drowsy driving, we don't do it by prosecutorial fiat. Well, you've got elected to the assembly next term. What would you do to address this question? The first thing that I would do is table the legislation until there was some solid empirical evidence about whether or not a standard for 24 hours of sleeplessness is a standard that makes sense. One of the things that we found out during the course of the Coleman trial is that the state of knowledge about sleeplessness and its effects on individuals um, is not very well developed. Let me just stop you here. Is there empirical or scientific evidence to support the With all due respect to distinguished defense counsel, the Judiciary Committee in both houses had public hearings. 100 legislators have supported this legislation, 62 assembly members, 38 senators. They've heard the public appeal through the testimony at the committee hearings. But I think his focus is on whether this accomplishes the result. Is there support for the 24-hour notion in the, in the scientific community? For example? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers have incorporated this standard as the national standard for New Jersey and other states to embrace. And I don't question Mothers Against Drunk Drivers about their leadership in public safety. Pam, what single act beyond this legislation do you think is necessary in order to create the kind of awareness you're concerned about in terms of sleeping and driving? Um, I think there's got to be promotional materials. Uh, I think there's got to be education in the schools. I think there um, needs to be a constant uh, ongoing campaign to make people as aware of this issue as they were made aware a number of years ago about drunk driving. And you think it's going to be possible to cast the same stigma on driving while dry, drowsy? Don't let your friends drive drowsy that's I been accomplished for intoxication? I think that that certainly is uh, a possibility, uh, but I think, again, because it's a much more difficult thing to understand and to prove at the time of the crash or the fatality uh, that people don't see themselves necessarily as being that much of a hindrance or a hazard on the roadways as other people do uh, looking upon them from a drunk driving standpoint. So um, certainly it's going to be, uh, as was said, a mountain to climb, uh, but we don't get 
to the top unless we start. And I think uh, a number of organizations uh, on that, assembly On that optimistic start. note, I have to interrupt you and thank you all for being with us on this very important subject. And we'll see what the future holds in terms of the impact of this legislation on the future of driving while drowsy. That's it for this edition of Due Process, but you'll want to come back next week when we turn our focus to another cutting-edge issue of law and social justice. Until then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Evan Brown. Thanks for watching. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual.